Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Hannah Hamlin and I am a physician with type 1 diabetes. Today we are going to talk about a very commonly asked question, which is weight loss and type 1 diabetes. How do we make this possible? And the answer is there are lots of ways to make this work, but it absolutely is possible to lose weight with type 1 diabetes. And we'll talk a little bit about tips and tricks and things that you need to know. I do think that losing weight with type 1 diabetes is a little bit more complicated than someone without type 1 diabetes because the insulin balance can create a situation where we need to eat more or less depending on what's going on. And so I will talk you through each step of the way. I personally have lost quite a bit of weight throughout my 20s. I gained about 20 more pounds than I am now and I was able to lose that. And that came with learning how to balance my blood sugars better, how to take insulin in a way that works for me, how to decrease my stress around type 1 diabetes, and how to eat in a really intuitive way where I'm able to listen to my appetite. I don't starve myself. I'm able able to really feel good with my relationship with food and not have any struggles about being concerned about gaining weight back. Now, this is such an important topic because weight loss can be more complicated when you're balancing insulin, blood sugar, and food, but the good news is it's possible and I'll walk you through it. Now, weight loss with type 1 diabetes is not the same as weight loss for someone without diabetes, and here's why. Insulin is an anabolic hormone. It helps the body store energy. Too much insulin can make weight loss harder. Now, that being said, not taking as much insulin as you need to keep your blood sugars managed is not a healthy thing to do. It can increase your risk of diabetic keto and it can also put a lot of stress on your body. When our bodies are under a lot of stress, it doesn't create a favorable outcome for long-term weight management. So it's really helpful to understand that one, we need to look at how much insulin we're taking in order to optimize our weight, but two, it needs to be enough to keep our blood sugar managed. And so the strategy for losing weight with type 1 diabetes is not to just decrease your insulin, but it's to change your environment, whether that's your lifestyle, your movement, your sleep habits, your stress, the foods that you're eating, so that you are requiring less insulin to maintain normal blood sugars normal being in those ranges that we look for in someone with type 1 diabetes that's managed. The foundations of weight loss are still the same for everyone. Nutrition, so eating whole balanced meals with protein, fiber, healthy fats that help control blood sugar and help with appetite. We know that protein is the macronutrient that is the most satiating, meaning it helps us stay the fullest the longest, and that can be really helpful to understand. Now, activity is also very helpful. You probably know that if you're walking around more, if you do some exercise, it changes your insulin sensitivity where you're more likely to go low. You may not have needed as much insulin for the same amount of food. And what happens is that exercise changes the amount of insulin that we need to get the same blood sugar outcome. It actually makes us more insulin sensitive. And so this is a really great tool for weight loss, regardless of having type one diabetes or not, but it works by decreasing our need for as much insulin. Now, sleep and stress are also really important because poor sleep has been shown to increase cortisol, which is a hormone that actually creates insulin resistance and makes it harder for us to lose weight. Poor sleep can actually increase our insulin resistance pretty significantly, especially after multiple nights of poor sleep in a row. And it has been shown to increase the hormone cortisol, which creates insulin resistance, which can impact the amount of insulin that we need. I know personally, when I was working in the hospital and I was doing night shifts during training, I needed a significant increase in insulin just to cover my blood sugar, even though I was eating the same meals, doing the same shifts, I was moving about the same because I needed that extra insulin to cover the insulin resistance that was created by the lack of sleep that I had during that time. Another area that can make weight loss harder is stress. And you may know if you're going through a stressful week or you have a big exam coming up or there's a big life stressor in play, it can make it harder for your blood sugars to come down when they're high, or it can actually make it harder to prevent those high blood sugars from happening. Because what happens is stress hormones, cortisol being one of them, can increase our insulin resistance, meaning that we need more insulin to move our blood sugar by a certain amount. And when we get into a place where that happens, we're gonna need more insulin insulin to cover that stress. And since insulin is anabolic, a fat storage hormone, if we're taking more insulin in, we're going to be gaining more weight or preventing weight loss. So again, with type 1 diabetes, insulin is always absolutely necessary. It helps us maintain metabolic stability and it helps us keep our blood sugars in range. The answer to losing weight with type 1 diabetes is not to just decrease your insulin. The answer is to change things in your life that make your blood sugars lower and 
make your blood sugars stay in a normal range with less insulin. If we decrease our insulin significantly without changing these things and it creates high blood sugars, that puts our body under a lot of stress, which isn't great for us long-term. It puts us at an increased risk for DKA and it is really unsafe. Now, if you find that is something you've been doing or you have a habit around that, or you have a challenging relationship with your body image or food that's made it hard not to do that, there are plenty of resources out there for this type of stress related relationship and I will link those below. I highly recommend if that is the case, getting help as soon as possible. I wanna remind you that it's absolutely possible to have great blood sugar levels, use an amount of insulin that works for your body, weight, and to feel good in the process. Now, I've maintained my current weight after losing 20 pounds about eight years ago now, and it really is effortless to maintain my weight. I understand what type of movement I need for my blood sugars to work. I have a relationship with food where I feel comfortable, excited about food. I love food. I'm able to have a variety of foods. I'm not restricted with any foods, and I'm able to get blood sugars that I really like, and I'm able to do all that while eating a whole foods healthy diet with some excursions for treats and special occasions. Here are a few tips to help with weight loss specifically for type 1 diabetes. So watch for liquid calories and snacks for lows. If you are having multiple low blood sugars throughout the day or throughout the week, then low blood sugar prevention is a great thing to focus on if you have the goal of weight loss. It's a great thing to focus on regardless, but specifically for weight loss, if we think about it, anytime our blood sugar is low, it's because we accidentally took more insulin than we needed. Now, doesn't mean it's our fault. It's that these things can be hard to predict, but if we are low after a meal, it might mean that we took too much insulin for that meal. Or if we're low on a morning walk or a morning run, it might mean that our basal rate is too high for us, whether it's coming from a long acting insulin like Traceba, or it's coming from a insulin pump in the basal rate given there. But either way, when our blood sugar was low, it meant that within that last hour or two, we just had more insulin than we needed. And anytime we have more insulin than we need, what happens? It's anabolic. So we're gonna be storing those nutrients, which is gonna to lead to an increased weight. If you think about it, if we're having all these unnecessary low blood sugars and we're eating food just like we should to bring it back up, then what happens is we're getting these calories that we may not have needed to fuel our body for the day. We just needed those glucose, the carbs, to help treat our low blood sugar. And so what happens is when we have a low, our body is so smart and it has this system designed to protect us and it puts us in fight or flight mode. Often it makes us hungry. It releases hunger hormones like ghrelin and it makes it so that we are saying, hey, we need to eat right now. And it's really easy to not only treat lows, but when we're very low, it's also pretty easy to over treat lows. I know that I've done a million times and I've had to really work on it throughout my life. But what can happen when we over treat lows is then we get all these extra calories that we felt like we needed listening to our appetite because our appetite shifted into protective mode to try and treat that low blood sugar. And it's a good thing that it did, but if we do this on repeat over and over, our appetite is actually a lot higher than we need for the calories we needed to burn that day because these low blood sugars are tricking things just trying to keep us safe. We're more in that survival mode than we are in optimal metabolic healthy mode. Often one area I see people fall into is a pitfall with losing weight is that they start running and eating healthy and they don't change the amount of insulin they're taking and so they have a lot more low blood sugars and it's oh i went on this run great i burned all these calories i was trying to work on my weight overall my caloric intake but then i had a low and i had to eat all these snacks and now it's like i ate more snacks than i burned in the run and you get stuck in this loop where you're just working really hard and having to eat more to treat the lows and it's really hard to lose weight that way and many people don't you can actually even gain weight that way and so one way Way that's really important is to look and work with your doctor as you are making adjustments in your lifestyle. You are implementing that new workout routine. You're going on that morning walk. You're eating more of a whole foods lunch instead of a processed foods lunch. You may need less insulin over time, not just the insulin that you take for the meal, but also the long acting insulin. So that basal rate or the long acting insulin shot you're taking every 24 hours. And if you don't decrease those things accordingly as your need for insulin changes, then what happens is you get stuck in this place where it's really hard to lose weight. And so that's something that's really important. If you're going on a weight loss journey, you're gonna be changing big factors about your lifestyle. It's really helpful to work with a provider who can walk you through these steps. 
Now, another thing is to look for patterns in insulin use and reducing unnecessary correction stacking. And this goes back to having too much insulin, right? If we have a high blood sugar and we take way more insulin than we need to make it come down and then it comes down and we're too low, then that could be more insulin than we really needed to optimize our blood sugar and keep it in a normal range. Thus, we're creating more insulin in our body and we are making it harder for us to lose weight because insulin equals fat storage in most cases. Now, insulin can also equal storing of carbohydrates into our muscle glycogen stores, but typically that signaling happens most often a couple hours after a workout. Now, timing exercise smartly is really helpful. Walking after meals can be nice because if we know we're gonna go on a walk after our dinner meal and that's pretty predictable for us, we may be able to take a small portion of the insulin away from that dinner meal because we know we're gonna walk it off. Another thing that's really helpful to know about exercise and type one diabetes is muscle burns glucose. If we get into strength training, we're able to increase our muscle mass. We're going to be more insulin sensitive. We typically won't need as much insulin, meaning that we'll be able to keep our fat levels, our visceral fat levels at a lower range. If you go on a weight loss journey and you are gaining muscle, remember that muscle weighs a lot more than fat. So you may be feeling like you fit better in your clothes. You may be seeing results in the way that you look as far as the circumference of your abdomen, but your weight on the scale may now change significantly in times where you're gaining muscle because muscle weighs more than fat. If our BMI is elevated because we have an abundance of muscle, that's not as much as a concern if we have more visceral fat or fat around the abdomen. Another important thing to realize when we're looking at food choice around weight loss is that processed foods are often designed to increase our appetite synthetically. We often hear about the Lay's potato chip crunch. The way that it crunches in our brain has been engineered by the food scientists in order to be addictive, meaning we want more. There are also some chemicals that they put in processed food that can do this, but we know that processed sugar and fat put together is what we call hyperpalatable. Our body loves it. It's almost like a squirrel story for winter. We say, hey, this is really good. And so we want more and more of it and it over rides our body's natural appetite signaling. That's why it's so easy for people to sit down and eat a whole sleeve of Oreos when it would be really hard to eat that many calories in the same form as bananas. I don't know how many bananas that would be, but it would be an uncomfortable amount for your stomach. And so when we look at foods, it's really important that we're not picking hyper-processed foods. And I think that can make a big difference. Often people see like these low calorie snack bars or these low calorie cereals and things like that, but processed food is processed food. So anything that is made with flour is technically a processed food. And it's helpful to understand that. I love, I'm a huge fan of reading the ingredients list. A lot of people think about moving in towards a healthier diet, they'll flip that box around and they will look at the nutrition facts on the back, which is a great first step. But often people just look at the carbohydrates with type one diabetes, right? Then maybe they're more aware of caloric intake. They start looking at the calories. And I think what we should really be taught to do is to look at the ingredients list of food and look at those things that you're putting into your body and say, are these foods or are these names that we use for processed foods? And there is a saying out there that we should only eat ingredients that we can pronounce, but there are so many healthy ingredients that we can't pronounce. So I'm not a huge fan of using that as a rule of thumb because it can get confusing. Most of the people can't say quinoa. I'm not sure if I'm even saying that, but it's pretty good for us. Quinoa or acai berries, right? Those are hard to say, but those are pretty good for us. Just know that when we're looking at this, there may be something that you need to look up. One of my favorite apps that I love is the Healthy Living app. It's a free app. You can actually scan the barcode on a lot of foods or look them up individually by name. It'll give you a breakdown of what the ingredients mean and whether or not we have studies to say if they're safe or unsafe. And that's a pretty good place to start. They also give you a red, yellow, green light based on food quality. This doesn't look at food calories, which I think is nice. Now, there are some things that are really high calorie density foods that are so good for us. And so I don't think that high calorie foods are at all bad for us. In fact, I love finding high calorie foods because it means that I'm going to stay full longer and I don't have to work at preparing more and more things to eat that day. So calories are not the enemy here. It's all about figuring out how to keep our blood sugar stable, 
decrease our insulin while our blood sugars are stable due to those lifestyle factors that we change, and then eat whole non-processed foods that are not going to change our appetite or give us a fake appetite signaling to make us eat more than we really need to. Those are the three steps that really make a difference. A lot of times people find that they have low blood sugars when they work out, and this is something that is really common, and it really is a skill to learn how to reduce your insulin, not during the workout, but prior to the workout in order to get through a workout without having to eat a lot of snacks to cover potential lows. The way that we do this is often looking at timing and amount, depending on the intensity and the length of the workout, but really understanding that insulin, most of the insulins on the market that are short acting insulins peak in two hours. If we are changing our insulin just 20 minutes before we start the workout, that's often not enough to prevent lows. We often need to start making changes one to two hours before when that insulin peaks right as we're starting the workout, because that's what's going to change when our insulin sensitivity increases during the workout. Now, one tip for this is that often working out in the morning before we've had breakfast or we had insulin for breakfast can be a helpful tip because we don't have a big bolus of short acting insulin on board that we have to guess how our insulin sensitivity will change for. So if we work out in the morning and we don't have any insulin on board as far as outside of our long acting insulin or our basal rate, we're more likely to be able to get through that workout without going low because we don't have this insulin bolus of 10 units or five units from an hour and a half go at lunch that could peak. And as our insulin sensitivity changes, maybe unpredictably for that workout, we're not trying to guess it. So morning workouts before breakfast can be a really helpful tool. And that's something that I've leaned into, especially with long walks with my dogs, is I just don't have to worry about lows as much when I do it before I bolus any breakfast. We've talked a lot about whole foods, but really understanding that higher fiber carbohydrates are going to be a lot gentler on blood sugar than processed carbohydrates. So we're talking about like the steel cut oats versus the processed oats that you just pour boiling water in. We're talking about things like whole wheat bread versus white bread. We're talking about things like potatoes versus pasta. We're talking about beans versus corn chips, right? We can look at the carbohydrates and we can also look at the fiber in these things and see that things with higher fiber are often gonna do better. I know for me specifically, if I were to eat whole black beans cooked, I would have a different blood sugar response than if I ate refried greens where they were ground up and mixed. And it's because it's gonna take my body longer to process those whole beans, right? Because I have to break down the outside of the bean and it's not gonna hit me as hard. So what happens is I get a better response from whole foods as far as not having that high blood sugar, right? And then when we get that high blood sugar, we have to do the correction. When we get that spike, it's inflammatory for our body. There are all these reasons to do it. And in general, when our blood sugar drops, it can make us hungry. You may have noticed this. I feel this. If my blood sugar is 210 and I'm working through the day and then all of a sudden it drops pretty quickly from 210 to 100, it's going to make me a little hungry. I'm going to start feeling like, oh, I might be low soon. I'm getting a little hungry. I'll look and see my graph is crashing. Is that because I actually needed more calories that day? Or is it because my body is starting to realize, hey, our blood sugar is gonna be low soon, we need to do something about this. Let's upregulate that ghrelin hormone, which is gonna make us hungry. It really is important to understand that better blood sugars make it a lot easier to regulate our appetite. So bottom line is, weight loss with type one diabetes is possible. It works best when you focus on nutrition, activity, sleep, and stress, which also keep insulin dosing lower and being precise with it to prevent low blood sugars can make a positive difference. And always do this with guidance of your diabetes care team, because as you lose weight and as you change your lifestyle factors, you will need less insulin. And so what will happen is if you don't lower that insulin over time with your body weight, as it lowers, you will have lots of lows, which will make you want to eat more, which creates the potential that you get just stuck in this cycle. So working with a provider to help you lower your insulin over time is really crucial step. And this is a part that makes diabetes and weight loss more complicated. And this is a part that I see a lot of people missing. And it is hard because a lot of providers aren't trained in weight loss in general. And so that makes it more complicated to find someone who can really understand what's going on. But talking to your diabetes doctor, they're trained in manipulating insulin as your needs change. And, and that's likely the person that you have access to that knows you and is writing your insulin prescriptions. So I hope this gives you a clear, safe framework for approaching weight loss with type 1 diabetes 
If you found this video helpful, be sure to subscribe and check the links in the description below for more resources. If you have stories or questions, I would love to hear them. Specifically, if you have tried to lose weight with type 1 diabetes, what type of challenges have you run across? What type of successes have you had? If you have any ideas for future videos or you have any big questions left unanswered from this one, please also add those to the comments below so that I can add them to my upcoming video list. Thanks for sticking to the end and I hope to see you next time.